August 2nd, 1982, around 1.15 p.m., sunny, calm day. El Smirnova was walking on the edge of a birch forest in the Vologda region in Russia, heading towards a clearing, when she began to hear a voice speaking in Russian. It was amplified like a megaphone. Come closer, it said. Do not be afraid. The equipment is switched off. At first, Smirnova assumed she had stumbled upon some kind of sporting event being conducted in the forest. She cautiously approached the clearing, and that is when she saw an unusual craft parked on the ground. It was actually quite close, only about 20 steps away from her. She also saw three men standing on the ground near the craft. She described that it was a circular, dish-shaped object, very shiny, reflecting the sun's rays on its golden surface. A semicircular shaped door was opened, and a ladder with 11 steps, she counted them, jutted towards the ground from it. Over the door she could see what appeared to be decorations, with animals and plants depicted on them, like how they would be on a coin. The craft gave the impression as being simple but durable at the same time. She next inspected the males. One of them was dressed in a bronze-colored overall and stood about 6'7". His skin was white, he had dark eyebrows and gray eyes. He was looking directly at Smirnova and smiling, not unlike how someone would upon greeting. The other two figures resembled Japanese males. The white-skinned man, whom Smirnova took to be about 25 years old, possibly American, and the commander of the ship, turned towards the other two and said loudly, Elkin Su. At that point, the two Japanese-looking men walked away in the direction of the craft. One took a seat on the ground under the ladder, while the other stood next to him. The commander then turned and stared directly at Smirnova. He didn't speak, and she started to feel uncomfortable. All at once, she could feel her heart racing, whilst also feeling sleepy and weak in the legs. Despite being young, she understood what was happening, and she became afraid. She understood that he was, somehow, like a magician, placing her in a trance, and she pleaded with him not to do it. Do not hypnotize me, she begged. She tried everything to make it stop, including asking him questions, like whether they were Japanese or Americans. For whatever reason, it seemed to work. The commander smiled and spoke to her. He had a noticeable Baltic accent. Well, I won't do that, he told her, apparently ceasing whatever he was doing to her. My name is Alakan. We are from a nearby star system, he told her. We came here to rest and have time to converse, but don't try to run away. We are capable of hurting you. Smirnova took this to be a threat, but she had no intention of fleeing. The commander insisted that they only wanted to talk to her. Smirnova asked them why, of all the places they could stop and rest, why did they pick that clearing in Vologda? The commander explained that their detector had been scanning the area and noted the presence of atomic weapons and radioactivity in the area, and they had become interested. She was amazed that he was speaking to her so matter-of-factly. She attempted to convince him that, as far as she knew, there was nothing of interest in that area. Even the settlements had emptied out, most of its inhabitants had migrated to the large cities. The commander then pointed his hand southeastward and told her that there was an underground depot about three kilometers away. He then took a round device out of the black bag he was carrying. The device resembled a beige-colored clock dial. He pressed some buttons and a luminous screen then became visible. Smirnova could see parts of her body in three different projections. She could see her brain, and green luminous spots dotted it. The commander then said to her, We will talk to you. You have a good memory. You don't smoke or drink alcohol. She confirmed that indeed she did not partake in any of those things. He then began asking her a series of questions. He wanted to know how humans came to understand the meaning of water, fire, sky, earth, those types of things. He wanted to know if she knew the meaning of the universe and if she believed in God, if she had religious affiliation, if she read the Bible, etc. 
It seemed to her that he was trying to understand what role religion played in the lives of humans. Smirnova was also asked if she knew her place on Earth, and if Earth scientists knew about the origin of life. He asked her her name, and she told him her surname and patronymic. Smirnova noted that all her answers were apparently recorded in some type of device. The commander then began to talk to her about history, even showing her a map of the planet Earth, how it was in ancient times. He also had a more recent map that showed the Earth with shaded areas, displaying rivers, lakes, golden cities, which were marked by pink triangles. Deposits of natural resources were also displayed on the map, and blue circles outlined the areas where three elements, not yet discovered by humans, were located. He indicated that his people used these elements to obtain energy. He explained that the stored energy would sometimes come out from the bowels of the earth during earthquakes. Smirnova found something peculiar about the map and asked why some of the islands on the map were painted over in black. The commander told her that before the year 2050, the earth will be severely damaged by earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, droughts, tornadoes, snowstorms, etc. Those were universal influences on the planetary process. Some islands would suffer from earthquakes and would disappear, he told her. The bed of the Atlantic would be very active. A ridge will rise in the middle of the ocean, and some of the waters will pour into the Arctic and Indian Oceans. Many cities on the coast will be greatly damaged over time. The commander pointed out that the Earth was very young, but was being settled and civilized at an amazing speed, something that was not quite expected. The uneven location of the cities on Earth was dangerous and could cause the Earth to go out of its orbit. Besides circling the Sun, the Earth also made loop movements that led to some superfluous changes on the Earth. He told her that Earth had suffered two basic cataclysms during its existence. The poles had changed their places, and the orbit had also changed. In ancient times, Earth had been settled by dwellers from five different star systems according to climactic conditions. The first humans had appeared in the African continent near the River Nile. Human settlements then arose along the Nile, their residents became knowledgeable about the measurement of time, and their calculation was according to the position of the star Sirius. The commander mentioned the pyramids explaining that they were built with the assistance of his kind. The layer between the limestone rocks consisted of an ionized alkali soil, elements which created an intensified ionized environment, and that was why it was dangerous for humans to be exposed within the pyramids for a long time. This special emanation was also detrimental to his people. The commander further added that the planet Earth was unique, and they also visited other star systems. He said that there were 11 planets in their solar system. He mentioned that there were many moon-like planets in the universe. They had apparently installations in the dark side of the moon. The planet they hailed from was one and a half times older than Earth and was quite small, but it was an important center to study the universe. Their planet was slightly indented and sedimentary rocks dominated. There were no tall buildings. All settlements were the same height. There was no surface transport. All travel was done by air and this was an attempt to not damage the planet. They called their planet Sunny or Helios, though the real name was Canturi, located in the 47 Ursa Majoris or Big Bear star system, about 45 light years away. They called the planet Earth Gia. The surface of their planet was 40.5 square kilometers and their population was estimated at around 200 million. Smirnova was next shown video images of the planet, and she noted that there were no skyscrapers, not even tall buildings. All the structures in the towns were semicircle, or horseshoe shaped, resembling amphitheaters. All the industrial plants were located far from living areas in order to maintain ecological purity. The dominant colors were pink, green, and blue. While watching, Smirnova asked questions and the commander answered them. She asked if they had a president, 
the commander indicated that there was only one ruler on his planet. They had no problems with food and they were able to produce tons of albumin in one minute. They also, like humans, had different illnesses that they dealt with. They had a family unit created on the basis of love. They made the majority of their journeys to Earth every four years. The interstellar channel that connected our star system to theirs was only suitable for travel every four years. The commander said about the structure of the universe that everything had a beginning and an end, and that everything was in constant motion. One form of energy transformed into another. Life was eternal in the universe, but not for every individual. The solar system was one of the smaller parts of galactic creations. The universe consisted of islands of such creations. The chemical composition of Earth and other planets was very similar, and that there were other planets with atmospheres similar to Earth where life thrived. The commander also added that they had both piloted and remote-controlled UFOs of different shapes, which were surrounded by a plasma field, which could display different shapes. Some remote vehicles they launched were controlled from interplanetary stations inside the moon. Smirnova, recalling his seeming interest in religion, told him that she was a Christian and worshipped Jesus. The commander answered that Jesus was, quote, the man, and mentioned three religious guidelines which were necessary, quote, at the beginning. Next, he offered to tell her about an invention in the area of biosynthetic albumin, which would spread on Earth. Smirnova refused, insisting that people would not understand her and that people were very skeptical about visitations from other planets. The commander then told Smirnova that they would return in four years and find her in the place she would move to. Indeed, Smirnova saw UFOs in 1986, 1990, and in 1994, though she never did have another face-to-face -face meeting. Thank you.